Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark in the ninth chapter, listen for God's word to you. Jesus said, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Now I see the connection of James about praying. You need to be praying for me to get through this tough text. May the Lord bless unto us the reading of the scriptures. To God be glory, dominion, and might, world without end. Amen. Will you please be seated? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Hell Week. And if you are familiar with the UDT SEALs and they're part of their training, they do have a Hell Week where they go for five straight days with only one hour a day sleep. And there they are tortured physically and psychologically. Only about 20% of them that ever start that training ever finish past Hell Week. You might feel the same after this sermon. Every three years, this text rolls around like clockwork. And many of us who do follow the common lectionary, usually what we do is it's time to preach the epistle. It's time to find the psalm. It's find, uh, time to preach from the Old Testament. But Lord, forgive us if we have to preach from the gospel text like this one. Now, there are some who are very happy to preach from this text. It is a favorite topic of theirs. After all, they think their major goal in preaching is to save people from going to hell. And that's about all there is to Christianity, is get your golden ticket. So you can get on the gospel train when you pass away. I can tell you, I've heard these sermons. I grew up in the Old South, and it was common, fair, in almost every church, whether it was Methodist, Baptist, or Presbyterian. I've taken American literature... I have read Jonathan Edwards' sermon. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, where God dangles the sinner over the roaring pit of hell by a cobweb like the sinner is a spider. I have been to the different depths of Dante's Inferno. I read about them. And it seems sometimes that the concept of hell is a driving force around some of the preaching. I will tell you, I heard it so often when I was growing up. It was very hard for me in 
the maturing years to accept that God was actually loving. I always felt like he was looking through the blinds to see what I was doing. And I became frightened that if I was doing something bad and I happened to die, it was a one-way shoot to the inferno. What we fail to realize is the word hell is a concept that is not very often used in the whole of Scripture. Even when it is used, it is three different languages. Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And all those are translated to only one English word. Hell. Now, most of us have grown up where hell is that place of everlasting torment and punishment, eternal suffering. And some love those and that concept. But if you scratch those individuals deep enough, you will find, I think, a hatred for those who have injured them at some time in their life. And this, this concept for them, well, they'll get theirs in the end. For when the roll is called up yonder, I will be there, but they won't. And Phil, for telling people that I was dancing in the pulpit, he won't be there. I was actually skipping down the aisle today, having forgotten at the opening. And then there are those who say there is no hell because they live in the illusion that there are no lasting consequences to humans' actions or human failure to act when called upon to act. They forget that God's love includes also an idea of justice, of rendering aid. Then there are those outside of the faith think heaven and hell are just fairy tales and I can't deal with them today. But finally, there are some who take the scriptures seriously, not necessarily literally. They're unwilling to throw out the parts that bring discomfort to the reader. They want them in there. I'm going to have to deal with this. There are those who read the scriptures listening for that word of God to them. But they find often that that word of God may be somewhat hidden. And they struggle and they study, because after all, what we read is in English. And oftentimes when we say a word, it's thrown against the backdrop of everything we've been told since we were knee high to a grasshopper. Every horror movie we have ever seen, every piece of literature that we have read, and every hellfire and brimstone sermon we have ever heard. So when it says in English, hell, all of that comes to bear.
Oftentimes the scripture is not as plain as the nose on our face. You gotta dig. I happen to be of this last group. Listen again to what Jesus says. If your hand causes you... Now this word, some people say sin, but the actual Greek word is skandalon, from which we derive the word scandal, but it can also mean stumble. If your hand is causing you to stumble on your pilgrimage, whack it off. For it's better to enter into the kingdom with one arm than to go to hell in the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better to enter the kingdom of God lame than it is to be cast into hell. If your eye causes you to stumble, it's better that you tear it out and enter the kingdom with one eye than to go to hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Whoa, that's pretty graphic. That is the most graphic description in all of Scripture. You might be see, thinking, well, Jesus said it and that settles it. And I would say to you, you better dig deeper on this one. It doesn't settle it. I want us to consider the words translated in English as hell. The first comes from Hebrew, Sheol. Now, the Hebrew people believed for a long time that when you died, you went to sleep. Oftentimes, when Moses was buried, they said he went to sleep with his ancestors. Or when one patriarch or matriarch died, they went to sleep with their ancestors. Some parts of Judaism believed that that was a place of rest until the resurrection and the day of reckoning. Sheol, the place of the shadows. Now, Sheol, translated into Greek, is what we know as Hades. You know how you always, instead of cursing, saying hell, you say Hades, right? Well, not you. Hades is also the place of the dead. Some believed that in Hades, the regular Joe and Jill who are not quite ready to go to heavenly places, are being formed and being corrected so that their soul would be ready for heaven. Another use of Hades is dead. In the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell. You'll see an asterisk in your book. Some people choose not to say that. Because it's not real clear on that word, Hades, in Greek. What most scholars say that when we say that, Jesus really died. And then Jesus was resurrected. Now we come to the text. And if you read the original text in Greek, 
you read the word Gehenna, which is an Aramaic word. You may not, Jesus didn't speak Greek, Jesus didn't speak Hebrew, Jesus spoke Aramaic. And that word, Gehenna, is referring to the Valley of Hinnom, an actual place. It was believed there that in the Old Testament days they went out to sacrifice a child in fire to the Baal, the gods of fertility. They burned them alive as a sacrifice. The valley still exists. They turned it into a park in Jerusalem. Good use. There's grass and there's trees, but not in the days of Jesus. You know what it was? It was a city dump. Everything that was broken, unusable, old trash, old food, and raw sewage was dumped right off. There's a big cliff. You just dumped it down there, and somebody set it on fire. How many of you have ever been to the dump here in San Antonio? Oh, wasn't it a wonderful trip? I think every child needs to go to the dump once in their life. You go out there to the dump and it smell, you can smell it miles away if the wind is right coming out of the southeast. And there's buzzards floating around. And if you look down at the base of the dump or different layers of the dump, there's pipe coming out. That is to release the methane gas produced by the pressure and the decaying of matter. As a matter of fact, they have to do that or the dump will blow up. We had one in north, uh, northwest San Antonio, just outside of the city limits, started burning and it burned for like a year. They couldn't put it out. Now, every one of the listeners to whom Jesus speaks knew exactly what he was talking about. The village dump, the city dump, full of worms and rats and a fire that could not be put out. Now, it's interesting. That oftentimes, people who interpret this text, the part that they don't take literally is cut off your hand if it causes you to stumble. Cut off your feet if you cause someone to stumble. Tear out your eye. In my case, if I did that literally, I would have no hands, no feet, and no eyes. No, we take that figuratively. And Jesus is talking and using Aramaic hyperbole. He's trying to get across how important it is to get rid of that in our lives that separates us from God. You see that? What is it that separates us? What is the stumbling block in our lives? What is the stumbling block that might influence another not to follow God in Christ Jesus? Get rid of it. Don't be separated from God. Because separated from God, most theologians believe is the definition of hell. 
It's living in the dump. Now, in third world countries, there are people who actually live in dumps. Your homework's to go out to the dump. Wait till it gets real hot. And to see the living conditions of some individuals. As a matter of fact, in India, India has medical tourism. You know why? If you want a kidney, here in the United States, you're on a waiting list. You need a heart, you're on a waiting list. But you go to India and for a fee, you can get one. You know where they get them? They go down to all those people living in the dump. They may capture a kid and remove a kidney. They may capture another a woman and remove a heart. A dump is where broken things are. Oftentimes living in the dump are the broken spirits. Those souls who have lost all hope. Those souls who don't know about God or have never had a chance to hear about God. Now, what if you happen to live there? And every day you were scavenging for food to eat. Trying to patch up broken chairs so you'll have a place to sit. Found an old tarp to keep the sun off. With the smell. The infestation of rats and vermin. And someday, one day someone comes to you and says, there's a better way to live. Follow me. I'll lead you out of this dump and you will have a better life. And they look around them and all the people, if you turn your back, they'll steal what you put together, the chair. They'll steal your food. Lies don't matter at the dump. Heartache doesn't matter at the dump. You just accept it as what it is. And now this person comes and sows the seed of hope. There's a better way of living. You begin to fall, follow them out for a better life. And all of a sudden you see they'd rob you blind. They had the chance. They don't really care. And Jesus is very terse here because he knows that what we proclaim with our lips must be in sync with what we proclaim with our lives. Or you will cause people to lose hope. We proclaim to be Christians, followers of the way. And there may be some who look at us and say, I want what they have until they get to know us and then they know we don't have anything. You see, it's about oneness with God. It's about don't let things come in front of you that separates you from God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what Jesus says. 
But also we can make the connection that also for those who don't walk in the kingdom, the kingdom of chaos and dump life is also at hand. You ask a miserable person that has no hope, if they believe in hell, and they'll tell you, absolutely, I'm in it. That's what Jesus is talking about. It's a terrible, terrible thing to destroy someone's hope or to never offer it. It's a terrible thing to destroy your own hope by removing and taking to the dump that which is the barrier between you and God. I would conclude with my good friend, Frederick Beekner. You may get sick of him. Well, that's okay. This comes from Beekner's uh, wishful thinking, a theological ABC. Great little book. Under the word hell, Beekner pens. People are free in this world to live for themselves alone if they want to. And let the rest go hang themselves. And they are free to live out the dismal consequences as long as they can stand it. The doctrine of hell proclaims that people retain the same freedom in whatever world comes next. Thus making the possibility that we can continue to make damn fools of ourselves and it would be limitless. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
disappears again at night. It's just another ordinary miracle today.